Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll work out technical issues in the background. Um, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Derek Chun Becker, and the talk we're going to be giving is Reimagining Cassandra Authentication Using Short Term Credentials. First, I want to introduce uh, myself and the other presenters. Uh, like I said, my name is Derek Chun Becker, I'm one of the senior <laughs> engineers on Amazon Keyspaces. I'm joined by Brian Hauser, also one of our senior engineers, and Steve Mazak, one of our uh, managers, who's going to be helping uh, answer questions uh, in the in the chat. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat window. We'll we'll try and answer them as we go, or um, if if we're running through something, we'll, we'll end up answering it at the end. So, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. So when we were building Amazon key spaces, um, one, of the, one of the tenants we followed was, was making uh, the customer experience as seamless as possible. So uh, Cassandra out of the box supports uh, username and password authentication. And so we, we, we made sure that using what's called service specific credentials, but immediately after launch, customers started asking uh, how they could use IAM roles uh, with with uh, Amazon Key Spaces, so that their Cassandra clients could could attach without having to manage all of the usernames and passwords across their hosts. Um, IAM roles are a way of associating a role with a container or an instance, uh, such that you get uh, automatically rotated short term credentials uh, that are essentially transparent to the client for their use. Um, our, our immediate goal then was to implement a, a SIGV4 client plugin because IAM authentication uses the SIGV4 authentication protocol. But longer term, we wanted to think about how we could expose SIGV4, uh, one, outside of Amazon key spaces, and also how we might be able to uh, contribute to uh, supporting other short-term credential systems in Cassandra. Um, I wanna uh, just put the caveat out there. I'm not a security expert, um, but I am passionate about it. And I think that it's, it's very important that um, effective security is, is better when it's simple as opposed to complex. And so this, was, this is a really important topic for us to, to dive in on. So before I get too far into the plugin itself, I wanna give a little bit of quick background on SIGV4 authentication. So SIGV4 is a form of digest authentication. That means that instead of sending a username and password, um, an identity and credentials are used to essentially create a signature or a digest. Um, and that digest can be comprised of various things. Uh, if you've ever used uh, digest authentication for HTTP, or if you've heard of CRAM MD5, all those kinds of things. This is a this is a common way of, of preserving secrets without having to pass them along. Um, for the purposes of SIGV4, it can also sign the content as well as as well as metadata around requests, and there there's also a timestamp included as part of the signature, um, and the timestamp itself is sent along as part of the metadata for the signature. The reason that's done is essentially to prevent replay protection, so you can bound how long a signature is valid for. So SIGV4 was designed primarily for HTTP. Um, as you can tell, we have things like request methods and URIs and query strings and headers that are very applicable for HTTP. But Cassandra uses the CQL binary protocol uh, for client uh, communication. And these aren't all applicable. So what we've done is we've taken SIGV4 and where we can, uh, we use fixed values for those things. Uh, such as the request method or the URI. Um, the signature is still dependent on things like the timestamp and the actual secrets on either side. So this is this is still considered secure. 
I want to talk a little bit about the authentication handshake in, in Cassandra. So authentication is actually optional in the CQL protocol. Um, the client begins its connection with a startup message and the server has the option of either sending a ready message, which indicates that it's ready to receive requests, or it can send back an authenticate message. As part of that authenticate message, it actually sends back a fully qualified class name uh, of the authentication provider that the server wants to use. The client will invalidate that authenticator uh, because it needs to know that it, it has an implementation for it and it'll proceed with the authentication if it does. Uh, if the authenticator is one that it doesn't know about or if it doesn't have an implementation for it, it, it essentially fails the connection. Um, as part of that auth response then, uh, assuming that authentication is moving forward, it can send information such as uh, in the case of uh, username and passwords, it sends the authentication ID and the, and the credential. Uh, in other protocols or other providers that Cassandra supports, it can send different things in that initial response. And what follows then is basically a back and forth of challenge and response from server to client until the server determines that it's either succeeded in authentication or it's, it's failed. Now, if this looks at all familiar to, to people, that's because this is based on, on SASL, which is the simple authentication and security layer. This is a, a, an authentication protocol that goes back quite a ways. Um, I believe it was originally uh, built for IMAP, uh, but it has since been ex extended uh, into other protocols such as SMTP, XMPP, et cetera. And it, it defines a similar handshake protocol. Um, there are a couple differences. Uh, one, the client is the uh, initiator of the authentication exchange. So it indicates to the server that it wants to authenticate, not the server telling it that it needs to. Um, but essentially the rest of it is challenge responses and an outcome. But Cassandra doesn't quite support SASL. Um, for one, SASL itself provides a mechanism for the server to indicate to the client which mechanisms are, are supported or which authentication protocols are supported. In Cassandra, it's not negotiated. It's basically something that's configured on the server side and configured separately on the client side. Um, like I said before, the client and the server have to statically agree on the authenticator. And if they don't agree on the authenticator, then essentially that, that authentication can't proceed. So if we wanted to support the out-of-box experience of uh, service-specific credentials, but we also wanted to support SIGV4, we needed to figure out how we could advertise different auth providers to different users. As it turns out, we're not the first, uh, I'm not the first person to think of this. Um, there's actually a ticket back from 2016. This is Cassandra 11471 that talks about adding a SASL mechanism negotiation to the native protocol. Um, this, this talks about essentially emulating the full SASL exchange where the, the negotiation would happen in the authenticate message. Um, there was a good amount of activity on this ticket um, but it was last updated in 2017. Um, from, from my reading, and this is just my personal take on it, it sounds like there is some disagreement on exactly where the right place was to do this. Um, and it's also uh, a, a, a change that would have to go through the actual protocol, because if we're going to change what goes in the authenticate message, it needs to somehow be backward compatible with the, with the existing clients. So, so we'd have to change uh, the client drivers, coordinate with them to allow this to happen. So um, there's, I think there's more work that could be done on this and we're gonna discuss this a little bit later. So among the other options, we have a new authenticator that can negotiate the mechanism. This is actually one of the things I think that was proposed in that ticket was um, if you provide an implementation of an authenticator where the authenticate challenge and authenticate result essentially negotiate that mechanism, that's one way of doing it. Um, this, this does, however, run back into the same issue of um, requiring coordination with clients so that you can be backwards compatible. Clients would have to be updated so that, they're, so that they also have an implementation for this new authenticator. Um, another, another option would be to alter the CQL binary protocol. Um, 
there is an exchange that can happen where um, the, the server can essentially tell clients various options that it supports. Uh, and it, in the startup message, the client can indicate to the server which options it wants enabled or what the settings for those options are. A third option would be to simply provide different endpoints where one endpoint uh, implements one authentication mechanism and, and the other, you know, a different endpoint implements something else. What, what we felt was the simplest path um, for an initial implementation uh, was to overload the plain text auth provider. This is, this is the, the out of the box auth authentication provider for the server that handles username and passwords. It's based around the SASL plane mechanism, which allows you to um, send credentials in plain text over a TLS connection. Um, you know, if for, for key spaces and for most Cassandra in, in, uh, instances where, where you want the security, you want to ensure that you have TLS connections for the, for the clients. Um, but the, the plane mechanism is defined as having both an authentication ID as well as an authorization ID. So you can you can have two different identities for the purposes of authentication and authorization. But in Cassandra's implementation, the authorization ID or the authz ID field isn't used. So what we wanted to do was we essentially special cased on that initial response uh, depending on what was in the authorization ID. Normally, the plain text auth provider will send nothing. It sends an empty string in that field. Um, what we did was we, we added our plugin on the client side such that if it wants to initiate that, it, it sends a SIG v4 to start the SIG v4 exchange. And then the server responds with a challenge that includes a nonce for additional replay protection as well as other metadata that the client needs to generate its signature. Uh, the client then generates its signature along with other metadata uh, that it uses to authenticate to the server. So just to give a little detail on, on what this implementation evolved, I wanna really quickly go over kind of the contract of the, the server and the client plugins, because I think, I think it's interesting. They've, they've given us some really good hooks to work with here. And I think this follows the theme of Cassandra generally having really good hooks into various uh, parts of the, the session and request lifecycle. So the first thing we look at is there's an iAuthenticator interface that you could use to obtain a SASL negotiator. So the iAuthenticator basically represents a factory uh, for these SASL, SASL negotiators. And the SASL negotiator itself is considered to be a stateful instance that's created per session. So each session when it, when it initiates authentication is going to get its own SASL negotiator that can maintain its own state for that whole uh, challenge response lifecycle. The SASL negotiator itself then provides hooks into that SASL lifecycle. So looking at the sequence diagram here, when we when we do the initial authenticate, we get the, the new SASL negotiator called to essentially assign a SASL negotiator for the, for the server session. The auth response then calls the evaluate response method the evaluate response method can, can re optionally return data. So it can basically return a byte array, which means that you could pretty much work this in with whatever kind of negotiation you want. It's not, it's not constrained to a particular format or anything. Um, those bytes are basically sent back verbatim in the auth response, or the, I'm sorry, the, the auth challenge. And then there's an is complete method that uh, basically tells the server if negotiation is complete. And if that returns true, then the server will send back an auth success message and calls the get authenticated user method to get the, um, the authenticated user that's been created for that session. From the client side, uh, we have an auth provider interface. These are, these are kind of mirror images to the server plugin where the auth provider again is like a factory and then the authenticator is used on a per session basis to do the stateful authentication lifecycle. And again, the authenticator provides lifecycle hooks where when we get an authenticate message, we'll create a new authenticator. The auth response calls an initial response method on the authenticator. This is where in our SIGV4 plugin, we send back that special string. Uh, the auth challenge will come back with those bytes that were sent from the server if it, if it sent some. And then our auth response basically sends back whatever outputs from the evaluate challenge method on the authenticator. And the evaluate challenge is what actually gets the bytes and determines if it needs to send back a further response and continue the, the, the back and forth. 
the auth success message, uh, if it's received from the server, essentially stops the, the handshake and uh, the on authentication success method is called on the client to, to perform whatever bookkeeping needs to be done there. So we, we learned a lot uh, out of implementing this, this plugin uh, for the client and also figuring out you know, what we wanted security to look like. So we wanted to take the opportunity to, to share some of the things that we learned back with the rest of the community. Um, so I want to hand off to Brian here and let him uh, go ahead and pick up where, where I've left off here. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Hauser, as Derek just mentioned. Uh, I'm a developer for the newly minted uh, Cassandra Open Source Contributions Group for Amazon Keyspaces. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the lessons learned in, in extending the security model and also kind of our journey of uh, trying to follow the security best practices. So Cassandra has become a go-to data store in the way that relational databases used to be. And obviously that makes it a target for bad actors. Uh, at the risk of being redundant, I have to also state that I'm not a security expert, but I really wanted to put on my community hat and share about the experience of implementing all this stuff and my, my own journey and just attempting to follow security best practices. <clears throat> So I'd be remiss in, in talking about security, basic or otherwise, if uh, I didn't mention some of the things that can be missed in the joy of standing a cluster up for the first time. So uh, I think an important thing about Cassandra is that Cassandra is open by default. And this was a decision that was made very, very deliberately. Uh, basically, this is done to simplify the process of nodes discovering one another, to make the initial troubleshooting of a bootstrapping cluster more convenient. It, and it works really well for these purposes, but it's one of those things that uh, really before a server goes to production, before you actually put data that you really want in there, it, it creates some, some work that needs to be done in order to lock things down. So here, here's the, probably the main items that uh, do need to be locked down before it can go to production. So the first one is clients aren't authenticated by default. Um, anyone can do anything. There's no role or user that's, that's tracked. Uh, obviously, that can be rectified pretty easily. You can use the authentication mechanism that, that exists out of the box, but it does take a little bit of doing. Uh, Internet communication is open, and this is something that uh, can be easy to, to overlook. So essentially, the nodes all gossip with one another. Uh, there are a variety of features that are available out of the box to, to lock this down. You can have the two nodes be encrypted. You can have the nodes uh, communicate and mutually authenticate themselves. Uh, those are all things that you should do prior to, prior to it going live. JMX is open on the local machine, meaning that there is no authentication for JMX, though, though it's only accessible via the local machine. Uh, you can change this to support the same, same uh, to support authentication mechanisms. And SSL is turned off everywhere, so the pipes are not encrypted. All right? Obviously, we, we want to turn that on. So for this part of the talk, I'd like to focus primarily on client and user authentication. Uh, the client authentication that you get out of the box is pretty much a simple plain text auth authentication. So the user submits a password in plain text. It's computed with a salt and uh, a hash, a crypto hash is generated, and then it compares the hash against what's present in the tables. Uh, and this may seem a little bit limiting, and it may seem like this is a this is very basic auth. Now, like above, though, this was a deliberate Cassandra design decision. Uh, rather than clutter the core logic with lots of different kinds of security integrations, the choice was made to, to make the security highly extensible, uh, just as we saw from the SIGV4 work, right? To allow us to like extend it to whatever security protocol that we want to chain into the system. 
Uh, I'd almost consider this to be a best practice uh, to extend this where possible, especially to try to integrate this with your existing security. Okay, so it's all well and good to say that it's a good idea that we want an extension. I think an important question is, what is it that we want out of an extension if we choose to go down this path? Well, the, if you look at these two points, you can see there's the first two points are all about inconvenience. And inconvenience and security breed security problems. Right? Uh, in the first case, we want an extension to help us centrally manage users. So this is to make things convenient for ourselves as sysadmins. It's very convenient if we have one source of truth for all users, because that means that there's less problems of when a user leaves our organization or our enterprise, uh, we don't have to go around and, and chase all the business services that they had access to and, and invalidate them, right? If we do that kind of thing manually, not only is it additional workload, but it's a thing that we can forget to do. Uh, if we're very clever as sysadmins and we have an integrated security product, we can even tie this to a meta directory of users to even reduce the, the authentication load still more. So like when a user joins a company or an organization, they all, all sorts of stuff automatically populates to the to uh, our user repo and then they all automatically get authentication mechanisms. And that's terrific. Uh, another thing we want from the extension is we don't want to make things inconvenient for our users, right? We really don't want to make users have have to juggle around new accounts, right? And this is this is, should be a core a core consideration for any time we're thinking about security, right? If we make things inconvenient for users, users will look for ways to circumvent security, and that's just a fact. Like everybody knows the story of if I have a if I have a door, if I have a door that my users need to access a lot, and that door has a ten digit code, and it's a locked vault door, right? Uh, people will prop that door open. People will write the code right next to the right next to the keypad for the door. So, in the same vein, we really don't want users juggling accounts. If we make them have to remember a bunch of different accounts and a bunch of different passwords, they'll do things like write it next to their desk. Uh, they'll use the same password everywhere, and that kind of weakens the security of that password because there's multiple uh, multiple places where it can be attacked, multiple surface areas where it can be attacked. And ideally, we want solutions that send a credential, that don't send the credential, but rather they send the proof of a credential. And if we do things in that manner, then we can actually assign a limited time frame to that proof so that we can, uh, we can lessen the impact of that channel being compromised in any way. Now, of course, these desires aren't new. Um, lots of... Uh, systems that are designed for the enterprise solve these problems. So a good question is, how can we learn from their example? So typically in an enterprise, uh, we generally already have security products of some kind. Now, the real dream for security in an enterprise is that users log in at the beginning of the day, and then they just they can access anything that they need to access without worrying about security again till the following day. So one of the more common uh, ways that this is set up is the idea of a claim system. So this is kind of an abstraction of a scheme that a lot of different use, uh, security protocols follow. Okay, and here we have three, three basic actors in a claim system, right? We have uh, the user who wants access to something, we have a business service, like in this case, I'll we'll say Cassandra. And then we have a service whose sole job is to keep track of uh, identities of users. And we call this the identity provider. And the identity provider is a repository for user information and specifically for user authentication. Now, Cassandra as a service is interested in this information, but it may have additional data that it wants to add, like it wants to add its own policies, uh, its own auditing, that kind of thing. 
So generally, the first step in an authentication mechanism is that a user authenticates against an identity provider. And typically what happens is they, they get a claim back. And a claim is uh, essentially proof that they've been authenticated. It's, it usually has a number of uh, qualities to it. Uh, it contains additional data about a user so that services can interrogate that and figure things out. It contains uh, a bit of data that's protected by ciphers and signing and or signing. And this gives us proof that uh, this gives us proof that it hasn't been tampered with and that the IDP is actually signed off on it. And this claim is also, as I mentioned before, given a timestamp. So it's, it has a limited range of operation. Now, after a user has that claim in, his, in their hand, they call Cassandra and they send that claim in an authentication request. And in this case, we'll, we will imagine that Cassandra has been extended so that it can make sense out of that claim. Okay. And Cassandra interrogates the claim, examines it, figures out that the identity provider is uh, has signed off on this particular user, opens a session, and away we go. Now, in a lot of ways, this, this claim system is very sim the, similar uh, in physical security, right? Like a passport is a demonstration of this. I, I, I go to the government. I, I prove who I am. And the government issues me a document that I can then hand off to uh, anyone who wants to know if I am who I say I am. And then just by looking at the document, they can tell uh, whether or not the government uh, has signed off on my identity. Uh, if you want a more specific or localized example, you can think of a boarding pass, right? Like I check in, when I go to a, an airport, I check in and Im immediately and I get a boarding pass. When I actually board the plane, they look at that boarding pass and that tells them that I've been authenticated. Now, I don't want to say that this is how all of these schemes absolutely work in terms of the dance of messages and claims. Uh, many systems will cause the business service to call the identity provider directly or they'll make uh, uh, allowances for that to happen. Uh, SAML, for example, allows us to be initiated by either talking to the talking to the server and having it start this claim process or, or talking to the identity provider. So there's a lot of wrinkles. But the clear takeaway for all of these things is that we have business services and they rely on an outside authenticator where users are centrally managed. Proof of credentials are sent, not necessarily credentials, or at least the scope of how those credentials are sent are uh, narrowed. The user isn't required to have any extra accounts, right? And all of these, uh, all of these interactions are bound in time. Okay, so if you're lucky, plugins already exist for for the security products that you're using in your organization. Uh, there are plugins that exist for LDAP, for Kerberos. Uh, for the most part, these server plugins use the intended extension method. So they color inside the lines in the way that Cassandra wants to be extended for the server side. Okay, so what's involved in, in installing a server side plugin of this type? Well, you can see here four basic steps. The first step varies a lot from implementation to implementation, which is establishing a trust relationship, right? So this can be different depending on which security protocol you're using. If you're using Kerberos, there's a lot of things that you need to do in order to generate a trust store and Kerberize nodes. Um, SAML is different. But the, the remaining three are very much the same, OK? So the next step when you've after you've established a trust relationship with the node and the, the security product of your choice, generally speaking, you get a binary, in this case, a jar, right? A little Java binary. Uh, you copy the jar to a node, uh, and then you add it to the class path somehow. So this can be an exported variable. It can be a command line argument. There's a Cassandra lib directory that you can copy things into where it will automatically pick it up. Uh, you edit the uh, Cassandra.yaml file, the basis of all configuration everywhere. And in this case, I have an example here where I'm specifying the fully canonicalized name of a different authentication method. 
and then you restart the node. So the last three very much look like a deployment to a node. And as such, that means that you can do this in a rolling fashion, meaning you can take, you can remove a node, apply these changes, and then bring the node back up. Uh, you can also choose to take a complete outage of the Cassandra cluster as a whole. So you can put everything down, apply these changes, and bring it back up. Uh, which one you pick will depend a bit on the uh, authentication method and the experience that your concerns that clients may have. Right. So if you change the authentication me method midstream, they may a, a client that is logged in through, say, plain text authentication may suddenly lose access depending on which node that they talk to. So it's one of those things that bears consideration. Uh, also, you if this is the first time you're setting up any kind of authentication, you, you generally have to alter the the system off key space, uh, replication settings. Right, it's it's often a good first step to start with basic authentication and then move to something something more grand. Okay, so here are some of the ways I was considering that we could potentially leverage the SIG v4 work that Derek had mentioned before. So in this case, we would have a some kind of SIG v4 server plugin that exists on the Cassandra node, and our client would initiate a SIG v4 communication. Uh, in much the same way that, that Derek had been ch chatting about before. So the client in this case would actually have the um, a SIGV4 plugin extension itself. So there's a server side and a client side. The client would initiate that SIGV4 connection. And then Cassandra would act very similarly to a proxy. So it would take that and then it would pass that information to the AWS secure token service as an example. And the secure token service is a, a service that gives us access to data about IAM roles and users. So from making that call, Cassandra would then get the server side plugin rather, would get the authentication info and would get the nonce that is necessary for the next part of the communication. And then in that case, what would happen is it would send the nonce back to the client the client would then uh, sign the response and creating that digest, and it would send it to Cassandra. And then Cassandra would use that to make a call to uh, STS and say, give me the caller info. And at that point, it would get details about the IM user, which it could match internally to its own tables. Right. So in this particular case, uh, it works very much the way Derek had talked about. The client only has to worry about their particular uh, uh, IAM role user credentials. They don't have to worry about extra accounts. Uh, because this is SIGV4, this is all uh, short-term in a relationship. And then we're centrally managed things in uh, STS. OK. So. There were there's some other ways that uh, we as a community could consider enhancing security. And here are just a few ideas. So one notion that is very popular in relational databases is uh, the idea of having um, enhanced privileges that come with a temporary account. So you might imagine that uh, a user needs to change uh, make some kind of sensitive change to the database, such as uh, alter the schema in some way, uh, or insert table or insert data into a sensitive table. So they have a, we have a concept of elevating a role. So they go to some, they go to some uh, separate uh, system, and that system interrogates them using an identity provider, and then essentially creates a temporary account in the Cassandra system, All right? And then that temporary account has a, has a username and a password. And the reason why this, is, this gets a lot of use in relational databases is because there are many things about it that are convenient. The first one is that the user doesn't have these privileges all the time. Uh, they have to use them for a very specific, they have to initiate this exception workflow in order to get them. The user also 
has to juggle a password and, a, and an account, but it's a temporary one, so it's only a, for the job at hand. The other real benefit is that that temporary account can be tracked with a JIRA or an issue. And then later, when looking at auditing, we know every place that that account is touched, we know that that is, was used as part of uh, resolving that particular issue. So it's great for auditing and for keeping track of all of the operations that happen as a result of working on a particular uh, problem. Uh, more often, plugins would be great to in enhance the ability that we have of integrating to security products. Uh, AuthZ plugins, this is uh, the AuthZ or authorization stuff can be extended in much the same way as the uh, AuthN side of the house can be. Um, and there are a lot of different security products that have general policy mechanisms that could be exploited. So you could have more nuanced security potentially. Anyway, these are some thoughts. Um, I think the clear takeaway from this talk is uh, we've kind of shared how we do, how we, we went about doing the SIGV4 support, but the big thing about it was that extending the auth in Cassandra was easy and straightforward. It was, it's meant to be extended, it's an extension point uh, all any issues that we had were all in attempting to implement that security protocol. They weren't in uh, trying to get Cassandra to Cassandra or the Cassandra driver to be able to adopt the the extension point. Uh, again, I'd be remiss if I didn't like call out the obvious the obvious stuff that uh, comes with open by default, which is that we want to make sure that we lock down security for. JMX and clients and internet communication. And I, I think uh, something that really benefits our users is when we find ways to integrate with the existing security to make things more convenient for them and also for ourselves. Uh, hopefully this talk has sparked some interest, uh, maybe encourage you to think a little bit more about the security of your clusters. If you have any thoughts about this or any questions that you'd have and any questions that we don't have time to address here, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we monitor the dev email list. We're monitoring Slack. Uh, Derek and I are available on those those forms. If you want to like, if you want to send us an IM through Slack, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can also send us an email at these addresses, and we'd welcome any conversation. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to share our experience. Uh, I think that uh, Steve is now going to help us uh, answer any questions. Do, do we have time for questions, Steve? Have, have we gone over time? I think the sessions are distinct. Uh, so I, uh, Nate will correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the session stays open and it's not going to impede the other one. <laughs> correct. Okay. <laughs> Do you foresee a need to rate limit off? Have you implemented some form of rate limiting to avoid uh, DOS attacks? Okay. 
<laughs> how long until you put together a CEP for critical changes? That's an, that's an excellent, that's an, that's an excellent thought. Uh, unfortunately, I think, actually, I think that uh, I personally am out of time. Um, so why, why don't we do this? We'll, like I said, we, we've given you our contact information. We'd love to hear from you on Slack. We'd be happy to uh, answer questions as best we can. Uh, if we're not the right person, we can we can hunt down the right people. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna close the session now. All right. Thanks everybody.